Right, and as Charlie mentioned before, I'm going to talk about repentance. And um, we're in a period of the time at the moment known as the month of the law. It's a 30 day month. And it's 30 days of repentance where we're supposed to have in our minds repentance and turning back towards God. It's actually prophetic as well, these 30 days. Because there's a period of time that's prophesied when there won't be a famine of the word anymore. Famine's prophesied, but there's a period of repentance when Jehovah's people come back to him. And I personally think that that's the period that we're in at the moment because it certainly seems to fit. People are starting to come back to his ways. Um, we're approaching the Feast of Trumpets prophetically as well, which is the second coming. So the way that I see it, we're in that period that's prophesied, uh, even if we're not, it's coming up anyway. And this is the month of the law and it began on August 27th, on the 11th at the moment. And what the ancient sages say about a law, they look at how it's spelt, Aleph, Aleph Lamed, uh, Vav, Lamed, and they look at that as an acronym. They look at it to say, Ani Lododi Vidodi Lai, which means, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Now, I don't think that it is an acronym, but I like the way that they look at it. I like what they, they draw from that. And it says a lot about how we're supposed to view our relationship with Jehovah, about what it's meant to mean to us. We're meant to see ourselves as entirely his. Like the song said, all of my ambitions, hopes and plans, I surrender these into your hands. That's how we're supposed to look at it. Now, what we looked at on Monday, was prepare ye the way of the Lord, turn him back to his ways. We saw that prepare means to turn back, to dedicate, to set apart, to make holy, observe, and to celebrate the way of Jehovah. Because what we've got is we've got these holy and these righteous instructions that he's given to us. But what we have in the religious systems that we have basically people adding to and subtracting from these things and just butchering them basically and turning them into something that's just full of stagnation, that's full of death. And he's given us this gift of his Torah, the complete Torah that he's given to us so that we can enjoy life, so that we can have it abundantly. So that's what we need to return to. We need to return to his words of life. Now, inherent in the concept of repentance, as we'll see, is this idea of returning to, and it talks about returning to the old ways, the ancient paths, returning to his Torah, basically. When we turn from sin, we're meant to start walking in Jehovah's ways. And it says in Psalm 103, verse 12, it says how Jehovah sees our sin when we walk in his way. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And this is, this is when we start walking in his ways. It's not just when we stop in our sin, because the two polarities, there's sin, death and evil, we have over life and good. Now, if we're walking on one side of the scale, then we're in sin. If we stop there and we just stop the sin and we turn around from it, we're still at that side of the scale. It's only when we start walking back to Jehovah that it's as far as the east is from the west. So we have to make the full act of turning around and starting to walk in his ways. Now repentance is a key thing for us to understand as well because it's, it's the beginning of our sanctification. Without repentance, without the beginning being right, we're not redeemed, we're not reconciled to Jehovah. So it's a, it's a thing that Satan will attack because he doesn't want us to get that right. He doesn't want us to start walking in Jehovah's ways. He wants us to kind of think that repentance is something that it's not. Basically, if he undermines the foundation that we've got in the beginning, then the house that we build will be built on sand. Yeshua told us to build it firmly on the rock, which was the word of God. He said, those who follow these sayings, they are the people who build on this foundation of the rock. They're the people who've got the stable foundation. And the Christian idea of repentance is being regretful of our sin. 
recognising it as wrong, and that is certainly a part of repentance, but that's not where it ends. See, Satan just wants us to go halfway, and Christians kind of have a skewed idea of this repentance anyway. They just think, once you've kind of recognised it as wrong, then you apologise for it, and then you continue on. You might do it again, but as long as you keep apologising for it, you're repenting, basically. But repentance is uh, its something that happens in the past, in the present, and in the future as well. It happens in the past, it's something that we regret. It happens in the present, because it's something that we stop doing. But there's got to be that vital future element as well. We've got to completely turn away from it, completely stop doing it, completely forsake the sin, basically. Otherwise, it's not repentance. It's just kind of saying sorry when you don't actually mean sorry. An example that you could give is like a mikvah, like a baptismal, baptismal bath that you're meant to go in to get ritually clean. Now, if you were to walk into the mikvah holding a corpse, it wouldn't make you clean. You go under the water and you come out again. And the fact that you are holding onto the corpse, that would, that would make you unclean. It would make the mikvah unclean. And it's like that when we hold on to sin. When we plan to do something in the future, basically, we haven't let go of the sin. If we expect to be cleansed by Yeshua's blood, but we're holding on to this sin, we, have, you know, we haven't let go of it, then his blood isn't going to cleanse us because the sin is going to immediately make us unclean. Because see, Jehovah, if we stood in front of Jehovah and we've got an intention in our head to continue doing the sin, to recognise it as wrong, but then to continue apologising for it, basically. He's not going to see us as clean because he's just going to know that we're going to continue to do that, to go out in the future and do it again. It's like, if I went to a strip club and I thought, this is wrong, and I rang up my spouse and I apologised and my spouse gracefully said, it's okay, just come home. And I went home with the strippers. It wouldn't be returning to my spouse's way of doing things at all. That's, that's exactly what we do when we, we apologise for a sin that we know that we're going to continue in doing, basically. We can't repair our relationship, which is the purpose of repentance. We can't repair it if we're still holding on to the sin. The you know, laid out a very specific method for us to repair that relationship, and it involves this repentance that happens in the past, the present, and the future. So we've got to, we've got to get that right. Now, there's a Hebrew word that's hodaa, and it's the root word of two concepts, two different words, to say thank you and to say I'm sorry. And it's the same root word. So in some way these two concepts are linked and they might seem like they're very, very different concepts, but they're actually both concepts are about restoring a balance in a relationship. If someone does something positive for you, then you might not be able to repay them you might not be able to rebalance the relationship, but by saying thank you, you're recognizing the imbalance in the relationship and you're acknowledging it, and that rebalances things. It's the same with saying that you're sorry. You, you might do something wrong to someone and you might not be able to repay exactly what you've done to that person, but if you say I'm sorry, then you're recognizing that you've done something wrong, you're recognising the unbalance in the relationship, you're acknowledging it, and that brings it back into balance because you're expressing a desire to bring it back into balance. Now, if you just say, say you confronted someone about doing something wrong and they said to you, well, I'm sorry, just dead sarcastically, then there would be no desire there to rebalance the relationship, so it, it wouldn't actually do anything. And that's how Jehovah will see it to us when we apologize for something that we intend to do again in the future and we haven't actually turned from the sin. Now, yeah. We might be able to delude ourselves, basically, 
when we apologize, we might say, well, this is repentance. This is me saying, I recognize that this is wrong and I'm sorry for doing it. I'm genuinely sorry. You know, I feel sorry for the fact that I've done this. But until we actually say, right, okay, I'm sorry for it and I'm that sorry, I'm gonna let it go. I'm not gonna do it again. We're saying, I recognize this, this thing is wrong, but I actually value doing this thing over you. And that's exactly what Jehovah sees. He discerns our thoughts and intentions. We remember that Yeshua is the word of God made flesh. This is what Hebrews 4.12 says. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we can't fool Yeshua, who's who we're going to stand for. He's going to be sat on the throne. He's going to discern exactly what our thoughts and intentions were. It doesn't matter if we say to him, oh, you know, I, I recognize that it was wrong. He's just going to see the fact that we valued it above him. And none of what we say is going to make any difference. In fact, we're not even going to be able to justify ourselves in front of him in that way, because it's just going to be laid there. We're going to know that it was self-delusion, self-deception in the first place. Oh, that is one part of repentance, is acknowledging it is wrong, then turning away from it. Basically, we've got the scale, and we've done something wrong, so we balance it towards doing things our own way. And when we repent in that way, we correct the balance. But what we actually need to do is tilt the balance towards Jehovah's way, seek after Jehovah's ways, that's what repentance is. It's turning around to do things Jehovah's way. Now, scriptural repentance is just that. The, the Christian idea of repentance is saying that you're sorry and turning from that sin. Hopefully turning from that sin anyway. But Yeshua said that he was going to follow all of the Father's ways. That he wouldn't even relax the least of the commandments. And he certainly wouldn't teach anyone else to relax them. So we need to look at the Old Testament to see what it is that we're returning to. Because we can stop sinning. But John the Baptist and Yeshua didn't come to the Pharisees and say, just stop what you're doing, that's wrong. And as long as you've stopped what you're doing and you've said sorry, that's okay. And the call was to repent, was to return to Jehovah's ways. He was saying, look, what you're doing is wrong. Jehovah's already laid down exactly the way to do it. Just return to that way and you'll return to the blessings, you'll restore the relationship. So we can get a grasp of what the word repent means, the English word repent, by looking at the Greek, which is metanoia. We can kind of get the, the Christian idea of it. But if you have a look at a commentary, it will say, Repentance also involves turning to Jehovah. But in these commentaries, it's quite a woolly, quite an abstract idea. It like, kind of carries the idea of, well, turn to Jehovah and you know, give him a big hug. And it's not actually scripturally defined what turning to Jehovah actually is. Now, a large section of Christianity will think that turning to Jehovah is saying that Yeshua is Lord. Yeshua says, just before he talks about building your house on the solid foundation, he says in Luke 6, verse 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Because there's so many people that call Yeshua Lord, so much of Christianity that calls him Lord, and yet they don't do what the Bible says. They haven't repented because they haven't turned back to God's way of doing it. So Satan has basically fooled them into thinking that they're repenting when they're not at all. They haven't even started on the journey of sanctification, on the restoration that Jehovah's got in mind because they've been fooled as to what this word means. How the prophets, John the Baptist, Yeshua and the apostles all made repentance absolutely central to their message. That was, that was their starting point basically. Without Repentance without teshuva, without turning back to God's way of doing things, the Bible kind of becomes a bit like a spiritual self-help book. It kind of say sorry when you're doing stuff wrong and um, 
love other people as yourself and love God in this kind of abstract way that you think about loving God. Whatever you, you, you conjure up into your mind that love means love God in that way. That's kind of where a lot of Christianity is at today. But the comparable word in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, to the metanoia in the Greek, the thing that's used in kind of a parallel context that you could look at and say, right, okay, that's the same concept, is teshuva. And the word generally means to return or to go back. And it comes from the root word, shuv. Okay? Now, there's a principle in scriptural interpretation called the law of first mention. And it's when a word is first used in scripture that kind of defines how we're to understand it in the rest of scripture. And in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, man's created perfect. And all that they've got is Jehovah's word to go on. They've got no knowledge of good, and good or evil. The tree of life, the other tree, that's equated in scripture to the pure word of Jehovah. In Proverbs 3, 13 to 18, it says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honour. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. So this is talking about the word of Jehovah. It says her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. The word peace there is shalom. All her paths are completeness, a wholeness. Uh, this bringing to restoration what was messed up in the Garden of Eden as we went into this fallen state as we moved away from the word of Jehovah. All of all of the ways of the um, word of Jehovah a peace, a restoration to these things. And it says length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. So if we live in Jehovah's ways, it brings us health, it brings us happiness, and it brings us blessings. I've managed just eating of that tree. And one thing I want to get clear, I'm not saying that this is the tree of life that was in the garden. It's, you know, the word of Jehovah is referred to as a tree of life. But Jehovah took away that tree of life and said, I don't want man in his fallen state to eat of this tree of life and become immortal. So he's immortal and fallen at the same time. So obviously he's not talking about his word, he didn't take his word away. We see in Revelation that it's a, it's a literal tree as well. But the scripture does describe the word as a tree of life. It's comparable in some way. And if we eat of this tree of life, of the word of God, then we do get eternal life. Um, we've got access to that eternal life that was taken away when the tree was taken out of our grasp. So we will get eternal life when we're raised incorruptible. <coughs> but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's a part of us, it's a part of our flesh. This knowledge is a part of our flesh, it's inescapable. And this is the, the kind of the battle that we go through when you've got the desires of our flesh, the knowledge of good and evil, and we can choose what we desire over what is right. And Paul talks about this in Romans 7. He talks about this battle that's going on. He says in verse 14, For we know that the Torah is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, do, I would that do I not. But what I hate, that do I if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the Torah that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the Torah of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, 
and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. A wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? So we're in this fallen state. Within our flesh is this kind of, is this knowledge of good and evil. What we need to do is we repent from this desires of the flesh to the ways of the spirit, back to the ways of Jehovah. And we see in chapter three of Genesis, going back to this idea of the, the law of first mention. We see the first time that the word shuv, the root of teshuva, is mentioned. Genesis 3, 17 to 19 says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the head of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to, unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So, the first time that this word, shuv, is mentioned, it's mentioned twice together, and it's actually, it happens at the same time as the fall of man. And the concept is of returning to a definite thing. He says, till thou return unto the ground, so there's a specific place to return to, and it says, unto dust shalt thou return. So again, return involves this idea of a definite place that we go back to, you know, with repentance, that it's back to Jehovah's ways. Um, Christianity in general believed that what happened is Jehovah uprooted the old tree, got rid of that, and planted the new tree, a whole set of new ways, basically. But what Paul says is that we're grafted in to the old tree, this righteous tree, this set apart tree that's always existed. We've just become a part of that, basically. We've become a part of God's ways. Christianity has got it into its head that we've started doing things a new way that Yeshua came along and he changed everything and then he planted this new tree and then this new tree is going to grow. And what the problem with that is, is that it's not just a new tree that kind of complements the old tree. It's a new tree that's actively kind of at war with the old tree, thinks that the old tree, the old law, that's been done away with. You get this kind of spiritual resistance to the fact that we are under Jehovah's law. And we get things like replacement theology as well, which is basically what Charlie was saying before about people saying, well, the Jews are the ones that killed Jesus. We don't like the Jews. But Jehovah is saying, look, I planted this righteous tree, you're grafted into it, but eventually the natural branches, the Jews, they'll be grafted back in as well. And then this tree will be beautiful and it will blossom and it will bear fruit. But what Jehovah wants us to do in this idea of returning is he wants to restore something to us. He wants us to re return to the blessings from the curses. Psalm 51, 12 and 13 illustrates this. It says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Now both the words there, restore and converted, are both shuv. They both have this idea of returning there. It says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So that's God turning man from the blessing, from the curse, sorry, back to the blessings. And it says, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So this is the idea of Shuv in the other direction as well. This is uh, man turning back to God. So both of them are turning ground, but they're kind of both sides of the same coin. Psalm 23, 3 says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So he restores my soul. The word there is Shuv. It's to return again. How does he restore the soul though? He says, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. So you've got that kind of dual concept there as well. He overturns man from the uh, curses back to the blessings, but he does it by leading them in paths of righteousness, by man turning back to Jehovah's ways. Ruth 4, 14 to 15 says, and the woman said unto Naomi, blessed be Jehovah, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, 
that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. So we see this idea again of Jehovah restoring this life. He's just there waiting for us to turn back to him, basically, so that he can restore. He doesn't want us to be walking in curses. As Charlie said, he warned he warned his people that if they walk away from him, that these curses will come upon them. He's just waiting for them to turn around and to come back to him. Joel 2.25 says, And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. So this corruption that's come in, the curses that have come in because of sin, he says, look, just, just come back to me and I'll, I'll take all of that away and I'll restore you back to the position that you should have been in. All we have to do is turn to him and start walking in his ways. It couldn't be any simpler. We just read what it says in the Bible and do what it says in the Bible. There's no other way. Jehovah is the source of all goodness. He's the source of all life. Anything that's outside of him cannot be good. It cannot contain life. We can't look for it anywhere else. We can't kind of devise these things ourselves and say, well, maybe if I do this, then I'll bring uh, goodness and life to my life. We can't do it. The only place that it exists in the entire universe is in God. It's the only thing that we can do. So it's futile for us to do anything else. It only makes sense for us to turn to God and say, show us how it's done. And we'll, do, we'll do things your way and everything will work out then. The man's, man's stubborn. Psalm 119 from verse 67 talks about this. It says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. So before I was afflicted, I had all of these curses because I broke your word. I went astray, I went to my own ways. Now though, I've returned to your ways, and I've kept your word. Now I'm in a better position. He says, thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy Torah. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. So he says, it's actually good. All of these curses have done me good because I've realized because of these curses, because everything's been going wrong, that I'm doing something wrong. I'm not walking in your blessings. He says, it's good that these things have gone wrong because now I can learn your statutes. Now I can see what the problem is. Seek that out. Verse 72 says, The Torah of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Yet uh, let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live, for thy Torah is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me and those that have known thy testimonies. So he's saying, I've kept your word. Let those people who've gone astray, let them turn to people like me who've kept kept your word and let me be a blessing to those people let those people be blessed through me and let them see what it is to keep your word let them turn back to me jeremiah 23 22 to 22 uh, 21 to 22 says i have not sent these prophets yet they ran i have not spoken unto them yet they prophesied but if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words then they should have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. So he's talking about prophets that he's not sent. He said, if I had sent them, then what they would have done is they would have got the people to turn from doing things their own way to doing things my way. And so they would have been blessed. And he actually says that their way is evil because that's how he sees anything that's outside of him, anything that's outside of the source of good has to be evil. You might not think, Sometimes if some things is evil, 
But if it's not Jehovah's way, it is inherently evil. That's that's the definition of good and evil. We don't decide for ourselves. We we look to God to define it for us. Now, he's gone to great lengths to kind of define this word and define what it is to return to him and define the fact that he'll restore what went wrong at the Garden of Eden if we just turn back to his word. So there should be no confusion when people read the New Testament about what it is to turn back to him. But there's a lot of confusion, as we know. People get this wrong all the time, and it's because they start reading the Bible at just just the, the narrow bit at the end, and they expect to be able to understand it from just that little bit of it. They skip all the bit at the beginning, which tells them what everything in the narrow bit at the end means, and they just lose this concept. They try, they try to understand the concept by listening to people that have also done the same thing, that have basically defined the word by the context in which it's used. It's like if I had the sentence that contained the word apple, but I didn't know what the word for apple was, it was just a word that I really didn't understand. I could put the word banana in that sentence and it would make perfect sense. I'd read it every time as, yeah, we eat the banana. And I think, right, okay, I know what that means because I know what a banana is. Now that I've put the, the concept of banana in there, I understand that concept. But if the original word meant apple, then I'd, have, I'd be a million miles away from truly understanding that sentence. Okay. Now, if we look at the New Testament, the very first word that's spoken by John the Baptist is repent turn back to Jehovah's ways. He's telling the religious leaders at the time, the people that he's talking to, see Judaism, the two main sects in it, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they've both gone astray from Jehovah's word. They've both started doing things according to their own traditions, which obviously is exactly what Christianity has done today. We need to repent and we need to go back to his way of doing it. And there's this idea that Judaism was this law-keeping religion and Yeshua came and he denounced this religion and he changed it but that whole idea is a lie what he was actually doing is he was saying to them look you've <laughs> you've created all these laws but they're not the laws that are in the scripture you've created basically a load of man-made rubbish that isn't going to go anywhere repent and turn back to the way of God. And most of the, the Jewish leadership at that time, they weren't Torah observant at all. They broke all of the laws on a daily basis. And they did it in such a way that they created laws that actually nullified the word of God. They created traditions that went contrary to it, um, which again is exactly what Christianity has done. They've created traditions that actually nullify the word of God. The word of God says, don't, don't celebrate me as the pagans do. And what, do, what does Christianity do? It celebrates Christmas and celebrates Easter. So that is nullifying the word of God through their traditions. And Yeshua said, you worship me in vain, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, which is exactly the same position. Now, the people who are in covenant with God they're told to repent in, in the New Testament. The people who are Gentiles and not in covenant with God, they're told to just believe. Two completely different things. And in Paul's writings, he's writing to people basically who, have, who were Gentiles. They entered into covenant with God, but immediately they went astray. And he tells those people to repent. He's saying, repent and come back to the ways of Jehovah, the ways that you've been told. Like when he says to uh, the people in Colossus, he says about the, uh, the feasts and the holy days, he said, don't let man judge you about how you're doing it. Come back to the word of God and just do it that way. In Deuteronomy 9.12, we see how quickly God's people walk away from his ways, left to their own devices. It says, and Jehovah said unto me, arise, get thee down quickly from hence. For thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves 
they are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them, and they have made them a molten image. So this is at Sinai. They've, they've had the commandments, they've been told the right way to do it. Moses goes off for a little bit, and immediately they just start doing it differently. And people say, well, are you saying that the church has started doing it, it wrong? We're now 2,000 years down the line from Yeshua. Of course, we've started doing it wrong. If the Israelites started doing it after a few months, they started doing it wrong. Of course, we have got caught up in human tradition. and Of course, we've started doing it wrong. It, it wouldn't make sense. It would make the Bible, would make Jehovah a liar if we hadn't started doing it wrong, if we didn't follow the pattern of the men before us. Psalm 14, 1 to 4 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God, they are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. Jehovah looked down from heaven upon the children of men. So these are the Gentile nations, not his children, he looked down on the children of men. It says, To see if there were any that did understand and seek God, they are all gone aside, they are all together become filthy, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon Jehovah. So he looks out upon the earth and he sees that everybody, absolutely everybody, has walked after their own way. He's laid down a perfect way to go, but everybody's walked after their own way. He says, none of them do good. All of them have walked after their own evil way. Now, there's a phrase that's used there, the workers of iniquity. It's interesting, in Matthew 7, Yeshua uses this, this phrase as well. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So we've got the concept of repentance there, the idea of turning to Jehovah's ways. Only those that have repented and have turned to his ways will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name? have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and then I will profess that unto them I never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity so we've got the workers of iniquity there and it's people who've tried to do things in their own way and then stick his name on top of it and say oh yeah we, we love God we, we follow the God of the Bible we've done all of these all of these works that are mentioned in the Bible but we haven't turned to his way of doing things. And he says, I never knew you. All the people he say that his law is bondage and that it's, it's oppression, basically. They don't know Jehovah. They don't know his heart. His law is his heart. It, it shows how he would take care of people, exactly what he'd do in different situations. But they don't know him. They haven't followed him. They don't know him at all. They've followed after some other God of their own creation, basically. And he says, I'll say to them, I never knew you, depart from me. And there's that phrase again, ye that work iniquity. It's the people who've gone after their own ways and not the people who followed after his ways. Isaiah 13, 9 says, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, for in me is thine help. So Israel's walked after her own ways. And by doing so, she's destroyed herself. But he's saying, in me is thine help. Turn back to me. Repent and turn back to me. And then I will help you. I'll restore you. And the answer to the corruption of man, whether it's physical corruption or whether it's spiritual corruption, is always to turn back to Jehovah. He will make things right. And if you look at the letters that are written to the churches in Revelation, the ones that he's got a problem with, he uses this word, repent uh, revelation 2 5 to the church in ephesus he writes remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent do the first works or else i will come unto thee quickly and i will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent so he's saying you know what it is that you're meant to be doing just turn back to that turn back to my ways and then i'll save you revelation 2 15 to 16 to the church of pergamos it says so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now the sword of his mouth is his word. He says, 
you've got the doctrine of the Nicolaitans here. Repent of that and just turn back to my doctrine. Revelation 2, 21 to, uh, 21 to 22 to Thyatira says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She knows idolatry. and gone after other gods. To repent of her fornication. Come back to my ways. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. This is a constant call to come back to his ways. Revelation 3, verse 2 to 3, to the church in Sardis, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Key there, remember the things that you've heard, remember what you've been taught, hold fast and repent, turn back to those things. To Laodicea he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Now, the church that he commends most highly is Philadelphia and this is what he says about them, he doesn't tell them to repent, he says, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. You've kept my ways, you've walked in my ways. The other church, of course, is Smyrna, who he just tells to keep going in what they're doing. They're walking in his ways as well. And most of the people throughout history that have claimed to be his people have not gone back to anything. They've not repented, they've not turned to anything, they've just gone after their own ways as I said as hard as it is for us to accept that's evil in Jehovah's eyes they haven't repented they haven't returned they haven't gone back to this kind of this fully established tree there they haven't been grafted into anything they haven't returned to that tree they've just gone off and done their own thing and 2 Chronicles 7 14 says if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So it says, turn from their wicked ways. Now, this is one of the most quoted verses in Christianity. And what they do is they look at their wicked ways and they define that as something else. They say, well, we're not wicked because we don't do this, that, and the other. But it's to, it's to misunderstand what Jehovah sees as wicked ways, what the way is that he wants them to walk in. The way that most of Christianity are walk, walking in is wickedness to Jehovah. So they quote this verse, they don't understand that they're not doing it. And he's saying to them, if only you will turn from those wicked ways back to my way, then I'll heal your land. We see the church is full of immorality because there's no real repentance there. There's no turning to Jehovah's ways. It's just, I do something wrong and then I say, I'm sorry for doing something wrong. And this just perpetuates sin. There's no kind of restoration uh, inherent in that system, in that way of doing things. And God's just calling the church back to his ways. And in this period, in this month of the law as a prophetic period people do come back they do repent and they do turn back to Jehovah's ways of doing things and this is this whole concept is encapsulated in one verse from a psalm about restoration it says in psalm 19 verse 7 the Torah of Jehovah is perfect restoring the soul very very simple verse there but it sums it all up the Torah is perfect and it restores the soul it brings us back into relationship with Jehovah it reconciles us to him. Amen.